I remember distinctly the moment 18 years ago when I found out what I really believed in. I was standing in a crowded conference room late at night, listening to the late Dr. Jonathan Mann talk about health as a human right. I was a graduate student in public health then, and participating in that conversation changed the course of my career. Back then, it was practically revolutionary to put the words health and human rights in a sentence together, mainly because most people equated the right to health with free medical care. And even though the right to health had been given lip service under international human rights law, Few believed it was a right that could ever truly be fulfilled, much less legally enforced. But Jonathan and a few others believed that the right to health was a global shared value we could all agree upon. And after he began writing about it, things began to change. Academics, international institutions, governments, non-governmental organizations, and civil society all began talking about the right to health as something to be taken seriously. Since then, every country in the world has ratified at least one international human rights treaty, including the right to health, including my own country, the United States. And over two-thirds of the world's constitutions include the right to health. Under international human rights law, the right to health means access to timely and appropriate medical care, but also the underlying social determinants of health, like clean water and sanitation, food and housing. The right to health also means that high quality and culturally appropriate health care goods, facilities and services should be available in a non-discriminatory way to everyone, regardless of where they live. But making the right to health real is not just about defining terms and signing international treaties. Taking a belief and making it real is hard. It means asking ourselves what is needed and how far are we willing to go to make the right to health a reality on the ground? In my country, the United States, before the passage of the Affordable Care Act, over 41 million people were without health insurance. Now, the Affordable Care Act doesn't guarantee the right to health, but it does require that all Americans have health insurance. And we needed health insurance reform in order to make sure that all of those people had a shot at health protection. I believe in the right to health. And I thought maybe this was our first step towards universal coverage. But that coverage comes at a cost. About a quarter of all non-elderly Americans don't have the assets it would take for a mid-range insurance deductible. When I looked into purchasing insurance for my husband after the law passed, I was shocked to find out that his costs would triple. This is what I mean when I say we have to ask what is needed for the right to health and how far we're willing to go. My husband needed health insurance, and I believed in the right to health. But the question of whether we were willing or able to pay that tripled cost challenged my belief in the right to health by testing the limits of my pocketbook. It's easy to say I believe in the right to health if it doesn't raise my costs. But the fact that it does makes it easier to understand why many Americans like me haven't yet experienced the right to health in practice. And it's not just individuals that face these kinds of challenges. Health professionals also have to ask what is needed for the right to health and how far they're willing to go. In the United States, we have a workforce shortage of 250,000 health professionals. 
It's not that we don't have enough doctors. It's that we don't have enough doctors in primary care. Understandably, after years of accruing debt, pursuing medical education, many graduates choose to go into higher paying specialties. But that wasn't the case for Lillian Holloway. Lillian is from inner city Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, and across the US more broadly, racial and ethnic health disparities permeate life. Across virtually every health indicator and outcome, everything from infant mortality to life expectancy, asthma to diabetes, HIV to heart disease, African Americans and other racial minorities fare worse than Caucasian Americans. And despite these health needs, we don't have enough doctors working in communities like Lillian's. We also don't have enough people like Lillian in the health field. Racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented across the health sector. And we need racially and culturally diverse health professionals. Why? Racial and ethnic minority health professionals are more likely to work in medically underserved communities. Their patients express greater satisfaction in terms of trust and respect. And not only does having a diverse healthcare workforce serve as an embodiment of the human rights principle of non-discrimination, it also creates a culture of competence that everyone benefits from, regardless of their background. In Lillian's case, she knew she wanted to become a doctor, but she didn't see a viable way of doing that in the US because of the cost of medical education. Lillian also believed in the right to health, but she faced an economic hurdle in realizing her dream of becoming a doctor. So she asked herself, how far she was willing to go for the right to health. And as a result, she ended up studying medicine in the most unlikely of places, Cuba. Lillian attended medical school at the Latin American School of Medicine, known as ELAM, located just outside of Havana. ELAM, which opened in 2001, is the world's largest medical school with nearly 20,000 students from 123 countries. ELAM was designed with the express purpose of addressing the global health workforce shortage. And since 2001, and in the past seven years, over 250 students from the US have studied medicine there. That's pretty remarkable, given that the US and Cuba haven't had formal relations in over five decades. The training at ELAM begins with a community-based course in the biopsychosocial framework that explains how biological, psychological, and social factors intersect to impact health. Just like at US medical schools, students begin with basic science education and complete clinical rotations. So in many ways, studying at ELAM is similar to studying medicine in the US. But there are also important differences. What Lillian learned at ELAM was not just how to practice medicine. She learned how to practice medicine in a resource-poor setting. She found a place where 68% of students are female with a majority coming from communities of color. 94% of ELAM graduates are working in primary care specialties like family medicine and pediatrics. And 62% of ELAM graduates are working in communities facing global workforce shortages. After graduation, Lillian returned to the US where she now works in Chicago at Cook County Hospital serving that city's underserved population. Lillian's experience at ELAM taught her the adaptability she needs to be able to work in any healthcare setting. 
And her commitment to the right to health took her all the way to Cuba for the thing that she believes in. Now, some of you may be surprised to hear an American talking this way about Cuba. After all, the long-standing discord between our two countries is well known. You may be even more surprised to hear me say, I think Cuba has something to teach us about how far countries may be willing to go for the right to health. Countries also have to ask what is needed for the right to health and how far they're willing to go. Cuba asked, and as a result, its healthcare system is mainly founded on population-based access to preventive services, what I would call public health. It does so by making public health services as widely available as possible through its many health professionals. In fact, Cuba has the best doctor-to-patient ratio in the world. Human resources in the form of health professionals are a national strength. And Cuba hasn't limited its efforts to its own borders. Since 1960, over 100,000 Cuban health professionals have worked in 101 countries. Today, 50,000 Cuban health professionals are working in 65 countries, including 465 individuals working in the Ebola-affected countries. That's what I mean when I say we need to ask how far we need to go for the right to health. Oftentimes, we lionize medical volunteers who work in humanitarian crises or other situations far from home. But rather than thinking of this type of service as extraordinary acts of philanthropic martyrdom, isn't this the kind of professional responsibility we should come to expect? If we don't, why would health professionals choose to work in underserved areas internationally or even in their own countries? Critics would argue that Cuban health professionals don't have a choice despite the fact that international service is better remunerated than domestic service. Others would say, Cuba sends its health professionals abroad as a form of national positioning. It may be. But isn't this the kind of diplomacy the world needs more of? Governments need healthcare systems that are available, accessible, acceptable, and of high quality. Health professionals working in those systems shouldn't have to choose between public service and professional career development. And it shouldn't be that it is rare that it pays well to serve the vulnerable. Most importantly, community members deserve to have health care systems that are accessible to them and health professionals that are respectful of them. The answer to making the world a healthier place lies in the values and beliefs that we as individual citizens, health professionals, and governments hold. Aren't we willing to go as far as we need to in order to make sure that the right to health can really be fulfilled? Here, I'm not talking about charity. I'm not talking about philanthropy. I'm talking about personal, professional, and systematic investment in the right to health. That means individuals, health professionals, and governments all asking what is needed for the right to health and how far we are willing to go. I believe that everyone, everywhere, is deserving of the right to health. Whether they live in the city streets of Chicago, the mountains of Guantanamo, or the Sertão of Brazil. Do you believe? And if so, how far are you willing to go?